benefit from uh, sustainable development synergies uh, 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 embedded in the mitigation and adaptation strategies is greatly limited by institutional and policy environment that hinders funding capacity and techn technological innovation systems development. Now that's in line uh, with uh, uh, what Mr. Damimola was saying about the role played by some of the government, uh, uh, governments of the various countries. The, the role not being they not playing the right role because maybe at the start point they, it's not even the right government that is in place so do you think the institutional and policy uh, uh, institutional government and uh, policy government is, is is contributing in some of these impacts 100 percent with 100 percent we know that i don't want to go into a lot of technical stuff but let me tell you this if you look at some of the things that are destroying the environment or contributed by Africans, look at the coastal wetlands in Africa, because that's an ecosystem that has marshes, mangrove, you know, it acts like some sort of filtration for water systems and floods. If you look at that and look at the strategy of various African governments when it comes to protecting the coastal wetlands, it's either non-existent or it runs amok. And anybody does anything, anybody locks around there, anybody does fishing around there, anybody does anything. There is no coordinated effort by the government that be to protect strategic assets that is going to guarantee or at least mitigate the impact of climate change. You mentioned about the Sahel. The Sahel depends 70% on rain, natural rain, to, you know, I mean, and coastal areas for the agriculture. But what happens? You have this foreign governments, not, not foreign government, foreign companies that come in to do logging within that same coastal areas and the wetlands. You have foreign entities, foreign organizations, foreign companies that come in. I mentioned the Ogoni land. That's an example of a coastal wetland that is supposed to be highly protected. As we speak, everybody knows that Nigerians just lost about 1,500 people. 1,500 people. And that is the area where you have all the lot, you have all the shells, you have all the uh, 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 whatever you call it, total, and all these companies doing massive exploitation in those areas unabated. When the government, you know, when activists like Ken Sarawewa came up in Nigeria to protest the devastating effect of the impact of shell in the Ogoni land, what happened? We saw what happened. Ken Sarawewa was, was killed. In this part of the country where I live, I live with a lot of activists that ran away from Nigeria because of this same very thing, trying to protect the environment. What did the government of Nigeria do? We know what they did. They joined together with this corrupt company called Shell in order to, you know, kill the land, jail the people and jail the activists. So yes, policies in Africa, in Africa are not helping because we need to protect what is ours. And that is how we contribute to, you know, mitigating some of the impact of global warming. Now, what about sustainable uh, agroforestry? As I said before, Nearly 25% of greenhouse gases in Africa is coming from, you know, cutting of trees, afforestation. I mean, out of the 6% that we talked about that Africa contribute, 25% of it is coming from just the cutting of trees, cutting down of all this that we are talking about, and uh, uh, deforestation. So the government, the governments in Africa, they need to have a clear, a clear land management schemes that says, it doesn't matter which companies were given the right to exploit in this area. You are not exploiting the Maasai land. You are not exploiting the coastal region of the Southwest in Cameroon. You are not exploiting the coastal land of the Ogoni people in Nigeria and so on and so forth. They go to the Sahel that is suffering from, you know, drought and all this. They are supposed to be protected areas within those communities that government is not supposed to be churning out you know, it's become a milking cow, churning out, you know, patches of land to 
all the companies that come to log or do whatever it is. So these policies need to be put in place. Not only that, we I talked about you know this industrialization, people leaving their normal rural areas where they live, their way of living, and flogging to towns. The United Nations came with a report that says sub-Saharan Africa, as you speak, is the fastest growing urbanization sector in Africa in the world. By 1960, only about 20% of Africans, I mean sub-Saharan Africans, live in cities. But as we speak, it's close to 50. Everybody's leaving this, the rural areas because of either afforestation, drought, or whatever it is, because the government are not putting in place strategies for these people to stay in their land, or either they're taking away their land from them. That's why sometimes you hear about this United Nations Indigenous People's Land Right, but it's just on paper. It's just on paper. We don't find concrete action of the indigenous people having the right to control their own land. But the government keeps going in, cut it, gut it down, give it to multinationals to exploit. And then Africa feels the impact. We see the flooding. We see the drought. We see the hunger. We see the strife. And, you know, this is the elephant in the room in Africa is what my colleague said, uh, Joseph. If I remember, it was Joseph or Damilola. Poverty. Poverty. The United Nations Climate Action Committee must address the causes of poverty in Africa. That is how they are going to address global warming mitigation effect in Africa. All these, you know, efficient housing, efficient this, that is the Western world ways of mitigating climate change. They should look for local solutions to local problems. That is not a mitigation strategy for Africa. That's not how Africa pollutes. Africa pollutes because there's poverty. People are leaving their rural areas and going to cities. And therefore, it's going to cause choking the cities and warming in some sort. It's going to cause urbanization issues. If you have a town that was built for 20 houses, and the drainage system in that town is designed for 20 houses, and then suddenly you have 1,000 people living in a town that was designed for 20 people. What do you think is going to happen to the drainage system? What do you think is going to happen to the water system? What do you think is going to happen to you know all the other things that people are going to rely on to their daily living? It's going to pollute. Because people have left their own town, I mean, their rural areas, they've come to the industrial cities, but those industrial cities were not built for that capacity and for those number of people. So the United Nations must address Poverty in Africa. If they really, really serious about global warming or how Africans can contribute to mitigating it, that is how you mitigate climate issues in Africa. Not about some fancy, you know, uh, energy efficient building or cars with less, you know, emitting engines. Or those things are good for the Western world. That's not how Africa mitigates. We know how Africa can mitigate glo glo global warming. And as I said for my prelude. Africa is suffering a colossal amount of the effect of what they do not cause. So the, the COP27 in Egypt must look into this. Afrique Media. Le monde, c'est nous.